Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here for our discussion on uh, sprinting uh, towards your uh, technological destiny, or we, we came up with something for this. It's uh, actually our API session. I'm David Ezel with Conexus, and I wanted to just introduce the session. Uh, we have a, a really great panel here. Gray Taylor, our executive director, is going to introduce them in a minute. Uh, as a reminder, uh, you can get a copy of the presentation here if you fill out the, the, um, the rating sheet. And there are also other educational materials for purchase at the, uh, at the main desk here in the education area. Uh, I think that's, uh, with that, I'll introduce Gray Taylor, the executive director of Conexus, and he's going to lead us through uh, our uh, destiny here. Morning, everybody. Everybody wide awake? It's the first day of the show. I mean, this is when we are sprinting for the next three days to get everything done, right? Um, my name is Gray Taylor. As David said, I'm di executive director of Conexus, and I am the least qualified person to be up here on this stage right now. I'm going to focus on what my core expertise is, which is market drivers and business drivers. These guys are the experts on what an API can do for us. And I think at the end of this session, you're going to walk away with a brighter understanding of what is possible and what is going to happen as we go along. I'm going to skip through slides. I'll do this. That's my high school yearbook picture, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that way. There we go. So after this session, you should be able to list the key benefits of APIs in your architecture. And we are talking about a fundamental change in architecture for our stores and our enterprises. You should be able to identify how you can use APIs in the future to improve your profits. We wouldn't be doing this stuff if it wasn't a profitable move. And that is what we're really here to talk to you about. Understand how to contribute to the API ecosystem. Uh, this is going to be a very revolutionary thing for the industry to execute and adopt. And we're going to just kind of uh, talk about some of the high points on this. So let me talk to you about the business reasons. All right. A few key sh here are some key concepts that everybody in this room, in fact, everybody in this convention center needs to understand going forward. Uh, technology will continue to empower the customer and shift power to the customer. The last 15 years as businesses, we had vendors telling us what we need to do to optimize our business. And now we've got consumers telling us what we need to do to do business with them. The whole balance of power has shifted. And we've got abstracted vendors who are sitting there saying, OK, I'm not close to the customer, but you need to tell me what your customers are looking for. We also have disruptors who are coming into the marketplace, and they're looking for markets that have high dollar volume that are hidebound to their technology, hidebound to their business practices, and they're going in and they're disrupting it. If you don't believe me, look at Airbnb, look at Uber. These are, these are companies that basically raised a lot of money to come in and disrupt whole industries. And the convenience store industry should not expect that it's not going to happen to us either. Every business is in the convenience business. Name one business that is saying, I'm trying to be harder to do business with. Wall Street Journal four weeks ago had an article on convenience retail. There was not one mention of convenience stores. It was how Walmart and Target and the big box guys are becoming more convenient to do business with, with click and collect, online sales, home delivery, and so forth. So take that as a warning, a challenge. Every business will be in the data business. How many people have got executives that say accounting and data is not a core competency? I'm going to tell you that data is a core competency. Technology needs to be a core competency for you to, to, for you to compete in the future, and it's very important. <clears throat> Scale is rentable. Don't sit back on your laurels and say, well, we've got 200 locations and nobody else has got these great locations. That filled will deliver gas to your, to your office. Uh, GoPuff will deliver convenience items to your, your home. All right? Location is becoming less and less important, and the assets that we have as far as tech stack, technology debt, those are things that are all rentable by the mercenaries who can come in and disrupt us very, very quickly. I'll walk through one of those examples. This clicker is. And if you're not familiar with this, look up Industrial Revolution 4.0. All right, we're in about eight, the year eight of that revolution. And it basically is where technology is going to begin to challenge time and space. 
It's really kind of mind-blowing. But basically, the, the ability to have something delivered to you at the moment that you think about it. Google calls that psychic pizza, um, where Google will deliver you a pizza before you actually realize you want to have it, and it'll be the pizza you want. That is their customer objective. All right, if you don't believe me, McKinsey in January of this year came out with a great article on uh, digitized consumers in the future of retail and basically said the same thing. The consumer is expecting you guys to be world-class in delivering technological interfaces to them and solving their problems. All right, so convenience isn't just about, I've got 3,500 SKUs and I have them here on the street corner. Convenience is about solving all kinds of problems on the customer journey to getting what they want on any given day. It's a very broad topic. And friction is one of those things where you don't know it until you really see it, and you have to train your organizations to start looking for friction. So here's frictionless defined, and it's real simple. It's what I want, when and where I want it, in my terms, and depending on my situation. So there are 320 million Americans in the United States. If I add those variables on top, we're talking about billions and billions of variables because my attitude about what I want and what I need, when I need it, in my terms, all of those things change with each purchase decision and what my mood is and what my current state is. I don't want to have a tractor I buy online delivered to my office on Thursday. I want that tractor delivered to my house on Saturday morning so I can use it. That's an example of friction versus frictionless. And this is really what frictionless is about. It's a whole lifestyle. And we are just a part of it. People shop to get what they want, but at the end of the day, people are looking for the frictionless life so that they have time left over to work on things that are important to them, self-actualization, whatever. But this is a lifestyle that we are a part of, and we've been a part of it. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, one of the disruptors. I was in, had the good fortune to be in Shanghai to take a look at some of the retail sets and do some store tours. And this is where Alibaba is doing brick and mortar retail. This is a Fresh Hippo. And um, here's their main strategy on business. Now, Alibaba is a fairly big name. First of all, it's automate all operating decisions, okay? Datify every customer exchange. In other words, capture it and make sure you hold on to it. It's valuable. Software reactivity. So where you see repetitive activities with limited variables in those, you need to software that activity. Get the data flowing. There isn't a person in your organization that could not find value from data that they're not getting today. And then apply the algorithms. Notice apply the algorithms comes last. Everybody's talking about AI. We are so far from AI, it doesn't really make sense to talk about it. We need more data. Data loves AI. And so our data appetite's gonna grow five-fold over the next five years. It should. If it isn't, you should feel bad about that. Now, when uh, Alibaba did this, they went from, in, six, in five years, from a $5.8 billion EBITDA company to over $15 billion. They're the one company that Amazon is afraid of. So I told you we we're going to talk about their grocery store, Fresh Hippo. So it's kind of like a Costco in that it's only got 5,000 SKUs, and it's an edge warehouse. Um, it's basically placed in all of the big cities, what they call tier one, tier two cities in China. And it's right downtown, very expensive real estate. This is 80% of their sales now are online and delivered. That is, that is a statistic that Walmart would kill for. <clears throat> and the main reason why people aren't uh, shopping groceries online is because produce. The belief is, uh, that person in that store is going to get the worst produce. All their markdown produce is going to go in my shopping bag, and that's what I'm going to get at home. What Fresh Hippo really does is, in their store, it's a showcase. And what you see when you walk in the store as a, as a new customer is people walking around in blue smocks picking the best produce, the best meat, the freshest fish to ship to customers who are getting it home delivered. All right? So all that store is about is proving to the customer you're not going to get slighted in your choices of what's coming to your, to your home. 30-minute delivery within three kilometers. It only costs them seven yuan, which is about a buck. And these are all in, independent contractors. And this is actually the lineup in the back of the store. So when you go into the store, it has uh, gantries that are just moving bags of, of stuff that are being built to orders, that are going to a back room, that are then being put into a big fresh hippo box that goes on the back of an electric scooter and is delivered within 30 minutes. Now think about this. 85% of what we sell in our stores is consumed within an hour, all right? 
So the 30 minute window is a big window that's basically starting to erode at one of those moats that we have, which is immediate consumption. We're getting closer to psychic pizza. 100% of the IT is self-written. These guys had the benefit of starting four years ago and they have not bought one piece of vendor code. They have seven developers per location. They have 100 locations. They have 700 developers writing code. It is all API and um, it is all built for flexibility, constant development, constant implementation. Uh, and by the way, all the AI that they use is still coming from the mothership called Alibaba, which has thousands of programmers. So these are just guys dedicated to the store system. They've gone from one to 100 stores in three years. And they did this in what I'm going to suggest to you is one of the ways to operate your business. Be first. Uh, you got to be bold and you got to do things at scale. Don't be timid. And by the way, if you get disrupted by somebody, first bold and at scale is also the way to respond to disruption. This is not fun. Um, so when I talk to CEOs, and I get a good opportunity to do that quite a bit, NAC Strategy Conference um, and NAC CEO Roundtables, here's what they say. And the tenor has changed. Used to be, I don't know if technology has a, you know, is really big for our company. Um, today, you've got 42 and 45-year-old CEOs who grew up in the tech age, and they're saying, yeah, tech is a given. Uh, what scares the bejesus out of me is that it's moving at such a fast pace, and I don't know how we keep up with it, okay? So they're thinking about agility. They're also thinking about how they can add life to the sunk costs of the systems that they already have in. And they're also thinking about how their agility now will also reduce the risk of disruption. And if you're a large scale company, um, people are going to come for you. And strategically thinking five years out, 10 years out, you need to figure out how you're going to respond to those things. The time to get it, to, to know how to use the lifeboat is not when your ship is sinking. You want to have that in place beforehand. So tomorrow we're doing a roadmap session. Here's just the graphic of what we think is, are the functionalities that are going to be hitting our system and hitting our, our uh, industry over the next five years, generally speaking. It's a really meaty slide. We're going to walk through it in detail tomorrow. I bring it up here for one reason. We are never going to be able to do this unless we change the architecture within our tech stack. We will be forever behind everybody else in doing this stuff. And so we need to, we very quickly came to the conclusion in our tech roadmap discussions that we need a fundamental change in how we have the house built before we start changing the um, uh, roadmap. There we go. So our challenges are this. Um, we have a lot of legacy systems of record. And by the way, this, this mirrors the US banking industry five years ago. So if, if you ever want to benchmark, go back and take a look what the, the US banking industry has gone through. We've got bit systems that are designed for normal business of today or yesterday. We've got inflexible data flows. The structures are, not, uh, are inconsistent. Enterprise data visibility is really hobbled. But you know what? They do a good job. I don't care if they're coded with punch cards. They still do a good job. And you don't want to throw out something that's functional unless you absolutely need to. And it's culturally and financially very expensive to get rid of these systems. Think about the culture. People don't like to change. They've been using them for quite a while. Our brand-based store systems are also a headwind for us. They're designed for the brand and the franchise. They are not designed necessarily for your store of the future. And so you're kind of hobbled from a brand or a franchise perspective. They're highly inflexible because that brand is also on the hook for PCI, is also on the hook for EMV. And so what they're doing is they have to lock down those systems or else you can't expose all your systems to all that data without some level of discipline. Legacy systems, are, they're interactive, so they're using standardized ways of connecting pumps and doing EPS. And EPS is even specified by the brand. So you want to add a new payment type, you have to go through the brand. If you want to add a new payment type at the pump, you have to talk to a lot of people to do it and get a lot of permissions. So <clears throat> it's designed for today's operation. And what we want to do is we want to take a look at how we can design for tomorrow. So our current state really is not that good. Innovation is expensive and laborious. When we talk about test and learn, it isn't test and learn. It's do a monolithic big data project and then learn. And that keeps a lot of people from doing the test and learn cycles we need to do to, to be innovative. Response to disruption is going to be feeble because we can't. We're fighting flat-footed. Digital culture is almost impossible to establish because we have siloed data that isn't in standard format. 
Tech stack is expensive to maintain. You just think about every project and everything that you need to do. And basically, all the AI benefits that we talk about are going to re remain elusive because we don't have big data sets to go and take a look at. So if we were a machine, and I, I guess I have to use a, this is us. It's a machine that's been built over 30 years. It can take a, a few knocks. You can even get a disruptor to come in and kick us every now and then, a little disruptor. But regulatory <laughs> banana peels will kill us. Or you get some really big disruptor that comes in and takes us out, all right? In other words, our systems and our stores, we really haven't learned how to take the knocks of reality in our data tech. What we need to be is this robot, which is the exact same robot after learning about all the other stuff. This is a, in a period of two years. So we need to take our technology and teach it how to be more agile and more respo responsive. So I'm done talking about the macro stuff. Let's get into the expertise. Um, we got a really great panel up here. One of the things we've heard over the past is, OK, so you bring up this galactic convenience store chain, and they tell us all the stuff that they're doing because they're multi-billion dollar organizations. We've got a great representation. First, we've got Sanjit Bajamaya uh, from Loop Neighborhood Stores a medium-sized retailer out in the Bay Area. Um, you've met David Azell, also known as Appy Azell. Um, Daniel Gaddy, who is a medium-sized retailer from down in the great state of Texas. Uh, Jim Wenner is a large retailer from uh, Sheets, as, and you know who Sheets is from the Pennsylvania market, doing uh, business in, I believe, eight states. And then we move to the Galactic, Brent Peters, um, who is with Circle K in the Midwest region, but is part of a 16,000 store global enterprise. So we've got the complete range of folks who are gonna talk about why APIs make sense to them, and hopefully you'll be able to walk away with that. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Mr. Izell and leave the stage for a sec. Thanks, Gray. Uh, so I, I thought it would be good at this point to explain exactly what we mean by APIs. You know, we throw this term around. Those of you who've been working in computers since the 70s, like I have, know that APIs have been around a long time. There have been a lot of APIs. So what is an API actually? It's a form of abstraction, that's a term of art that we use, but it simplifies the contract between client and server. One of the things that has happened with APIs in more recent years is the locations of those clients and servers have become much more widely separated. So this is not a new term, and it's not even a new concept, but the implementation uh, has evolved to the point where we're, we're ready to take advantage of it. So this is a brief history of APIs. Uh, back in the late 90s, this really smart guy named Dave Weiner, who also invented RSS, if anybody remembers RSS news feeds. Um, he was an XML guy, he invented uh, XML RPC. And John Hervey helped uh, PCAT's uh, Nax Technology implement XML as a first uh, implementer. I think he won a technology award for that. Um, and that, but that was back in 1998. And that was the first place, we, we were actually doing XML RPC with the big boys. What intervened with SOAP and AJAX were, SOAP especially was a complication. Uh, it, everything got very uh, embedded in the operating system. Uh, AJAX was bringing it back down into the web browser and finally we're at RESTful APIs and RESTful APIs, when we talk about APIs here, that's what we're talking about. So a couple of success stories. Um, these companies have all implemented RESTful web service APIs as part of their business strategy. Stripe, uh, as you know, as a payment provider, they have actually succeeded by having a developer first attitude toward how they develop their APIs. So they have toolkits, they have ways of implementing, they bring the developers in, they want a frictionless uh, connection with all of those developers to write apps. eBay has had huge success. Salesforce is 90% of their revenue is API based. Uh, Walmart has quite a few takers on their open API initiative. It is a way for them to attract partners in selling their goods. This is a one potential advantage of adopting or exposing APIs is that your today competitors could actually be your tomorrow partners. There are a million ways to build a business this way. 
IRS I put up here more for fun, but there is an IRS to go app. You could put it on your phone and it is API based. Uh, Amazon is really though the big dog in the room. Amazon started by trying to have an API that you could buy, uh, review goods and buy them. And they discovered that it was also complicated. They need to go back and blow it up, de uh, decompose it. And then they discovered that selling the platform uh, was the most profitable thing they could do. 10% of Amazon revenue is in selling just the platform that they um, have created, and it is uh, their highest margin business. So they make a, a tremendous percentage of their overall profit just from AWS. Uh, I wanted to introduce technical debt real quick because all of our panelists are keen to reduce technical debt. Technical debt is what happens when you push your supplier to implement a one-off solution because you have an immediate need. Um, at the moment that you've done that without a proper architecture overview, you have increased your technical debt. What it means is you're paying interest on that. You're gonna pay interest the next time you ask for another change and it's even more complicated. APIs are one way to reduce technical debt. Another way uh, that APIs can help reduce uh, technical debt is that bespoke or uh, siloed applications always increase technical debt. APIs, especially standards-based APIs, can help reduce technical debt. You can change vendors more quickly, you have more agility. So these are the key benefits, and they're brief. Uh, APIs give you the ability to monetize your own data, uh, introduce strategies, and uh, lower your technical debt. And also, you can create new lines of business and develop new partners. And so I think we're now ready to hear from our panel. Oh, that's right, but it's not mine. It's not yours. <laughs> so I want to talk and <clears throat> give you a quick overview of what we're really talking about in a visual perspective. We're talking about rewiring the enterprise. Here is, uh, if you remember this little graphic, this little graphic represents our current technology, all right? And what we're really hearing from some of the forward thinkers is that they're creating a new central nervous system. I've heard the term brain use, um, but basically it's a data repository. It's memory and it's processing that is outside of our existing systems. And what they're doing is we're, they're asking us to put together structured legacy data exchange APIs that extract data from all kinds of systems that we currently have. Go ask your CFO how long it takes to do a, a financial close at the end of a month. He's pulling stuff from this system, that system, that system, and trying to combine it together. You can use RPA as a short-term um, uh, uh, solution to that, but really what they're looking for is a long-term solution that starts combining this stuff. Um, so now let's talk about new innovations. Uh, people are adopting DoorDash. Right now the user interface is wet, wetware. It's a tablet. Somebody reads the tablet, inputs it into the kitchen production system. And this is happening in the QSR industry as well. This gives us an opportunity now to use an API to connect to a DoorDash or a, um, a Grubhub or somebody of that nature as an example. Um, associate suppliers and customers. Think about distribution of data. Right now, we're not even distributing it to our associates. But customers are gonna to wanna to get into your data stack at various levels, not just at the store with a loyalty program, but think in terms of how you expose yourself to the customers in, in, in meeting their needs. Suppliers are desperate for data. And you'll hear about uh, how the, the really good operators are sharing openly their data with suppliers that make them better. So we need to rethink how, who's gonna access this system. And using the central nervous system allows us to do that. And it's gonna be a set of APIs. Um, we need data. Remember I said, for us to really get into doing the artificial intelligence stuff, we need contextual data that adds context to the BI data that we're getting from our legacy systems. Where's that gonna come from? It's IoT data that's scraped off the web. Maybe it's DTN reporting up to the hour weather reports for each one of my stores by geocode. But basically you're collecting now all of this data into that same ner central nervous system so that down the road you have the ability to start drawing out some conclusions and some predictive analytics because that's essentially where we wanna go. Machine learning and predictive analytics that come out of that, that neural system that's, that's being engineered at the end. We'll never do this if we need to be extracting data and normalizing it out of existing legacy systems on the fly. 
And there's a reason why Hadoop is no longer one of the most popular development systems because companies got smart and said, instead of forensically doing that data structuring, I'm going to start doing it in real time. And that's what APIs really offer, is a real-time data structure. So with that, now we open it up. Good. So I've got some questions to kick off. We're doing a Q&A session, or at this point. Um, we're doing a Q&A session, and then we'll kind of do a wrap and close. Um, my first question to this panel is, what are some of the top areas for, for API usage for standards, um, for, for standardization of data? Anybody want to comment in your own organization? Um, yeah, I'll jump right in. Um, good morning, by the way. Uh, we have a number of solutions that we have deployed uh, over the last two or three years, and some of them are very mature. Others are still being developed you know, we've got a, a loyalty solution, we've got an ACH solution, we've got a mobile app that integrates both of those that can take payments at the pump, that can take payments inside using a barcode through a scanner. And that's that same solution is working to, um, to be able to have kind of a, a mobile kiosk so it can take transactions on its own and not have to uh, use through the point of sale. Uh, we, we've got a self-checkout so system that we're testing at multiple sites. We've got a standard kiosk that we're using. And I tell you all that to say that the one thing that's centrally needed is a price book. Now, you would think, you would think that if you have a developed price book from your back office solution that is mature and uh, deployed to all of your, your point of sale systems that you have in your store, that that would be easy to capture that data and give it to those various third-party vendors that I mentioned previously. It's not. It's not at all. Um, and the primary reason it's not is because every one of those vendors requests that information in, in a different way. They all want that price book data differently. Some people want A, B, and C from within the specific price book. Others want A, B, C plus X, Y, Z. Some want a different delimiter. Some want um, just all sorts of different components. And once you have that file, prepared and ready to send, uh, they want it delivered in a different way. You know, some of them wanted FTP, some of it wanted sent through SFTP. There's all sorts of different options for the various vendors. And um, one of the big challenges is when uh, data is requested, you know, sometimes it's very easy to massage that from what we can take out of our uh, back office solution. And oftentimes it's not. And they need it very, very custom, very proprietary. And so it's, it's a real challenge to get that. And when that happens, we've got to go to our back office provider. And, uh, you know, and, and we're not throwing them under the bus at all. We understand that when we come to them needing an integration to be made and customization to be done, it takes their time. Time is money. We get an invoice for that as a result. And it's just it's this continuing reinventing the wheel that is just a, a great frustration for us uh, surrounding price books. So um, you know, we would love if there was a way to very simply and, and with, with standards, with adoption from both the, the third party vendors and the back office suite to easily take that data, capture it, and then through an API, send that data directly to those third parties. And then at any point when you run across a new technology that you want to deploy that needs, and again, I'm just talking price, but these gentlemen can expand on it, a lot of other APIs and they'll talk about those later. But you know, from, from the, the price book perspective, when you come across that new technology that you want to deploy, it's seamless, it's easy. You just move forward. You don't hit that roadblock. You don't have that stopping point. So that's, that's a big one for us. Anybody else have? Yeah, in addition to Daniel's point, there is a, for us, there is also a need to move all the sales data from all these silo systems and bring them back to your back office system so that you can generate things like um, real-time inventory, financial reports, and so on. So there is a need for um, standard API interface so that we can bring all the sales data information from different these disparate systems similarly to your organization. Brent? Just a quick note from a Circle K perspective, we prioritized our, uh, our API strategy to start with three key areas. Um, as Daniel talked about, working on uh, product uh, is a, a key one for us. In addition to that, though, the, the uh, order data is a critical piece for us. Uh, we've talked about it several times already this morning. 
the variation and the, the expansion of different ways that customers are engaging to order product uh, makes that a priority for us. Uh, and the third area is around loyalty, uh, understanding who our customers are, understanding what they're looking for, uh, and being able to deal with, again, the variation, uh, the proliferation of different loyalty programs, uh, being able to bring all that together is a, uh, the third area that we're focused on. So would agree with my, my colleagues on the ones they've mentioned. Um, other ideas for us as well are uh, other systems outside of the normal point of sale to price book, uh, which would be things like car washes, uh, commercial fuel on the outside, and, and bringing those into a more integrated um, structure. Mm -hmm. So most of your, your systems today, is, I think you're in various states of, of API deployment. Some of you have been working on it for a while. Uh, how do you see APIs improving the business, the business effectiveness over the long haul? What do you see the, the impact and, 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 and what kind of buy-in have you gotten from the other disciplines within your organization? So when you bring the API in the picture, uh, what I have seen or experienced is that it significantly reduces your onboarding any new vendor or new product in your ecosystem. You can quickly um, integrate them, the cost will be reduced. So a uh, standard is uh, needed right now, and it's, uh, it's about time that we bring a lot of uh, vendors and retailers on table to talk about uh, standard APIs. Yeah, this is a pretty techy uh, discussion. Who in, who in here are from the IT world? Okay, so all of you have what I like to refer to as bruised or broken feet. Um, when, when, this, when this type of situation comes up, and you've got that new technology that you're trying to <clears throat> that you're trying to deploy, but you have these roadblocks. Uh, the the way I have uh, the the analogy I've used in the past is that you've got this brick that you are kicking down a path, right? So you've got this this project, this brick here, and there's an inroad, and you can get there the hard way, and you can just break your toes and bruise your feet and and let that gangrene set right in, and that's what we all too often do is is just forcefully kick that project to completion, but it's never easy. It's never seamless. So uh, just avoiding that brick would be a, a huge one. Cool. You know, for us, the Circle K promise to our customers is to make it easy. Uh, and so that, how do we bring that to life is really where the benefits come for us in terms of speeding up that change cycle. How do we get capability uh, that enables our teams internally, our operations folks, uh, to make it easy for customers. Uh, we're looking for ways to leverage uh, this capability, this, this technology, uh, to drive, significantly reduce that change cycle where we have to integrate. You know, it, it's a many-to-many -many world we live in, uh, and so as we look at how we bring pieces together, whether it's loyalty or whether it's uh, delivery capability, all those challenges that are coming at us, how do we speed up that change cycle? And so uh, we really are, are placing a bet on API services as a way to do that. Uh, and it's being deliberate uh, for any new efforts that you're doing internally, uh, new customer interact or new um, vendor interactions you're having on software or hardware that you're purchasing, having those discussions about what, ATI, what APIs are available or you're using them, um, putting that into any discussions that you're having to try to um, you know, make it the standard, standard thinking, standard operations that it, you're API first um, and not looking for those point-to-point -point solutions. So a lot of what we're talking about on rewiring the, the enterprise is, is, is also very dependent on cloud or hybrid cloud. Um, and we all know from experience that our, our network communications aren't exactly <clears throat> um, Six Sigma. Um, so what kind of challenges do you see in deploying this advanced technology as we, as we put it in the stores that you know, we may have to uh, move to edge server mentality? How do, how do we accommodate all that? I think, I think it's really important that we're all individually and collectively talking about it from an architectural standpoint. Um, we, we work in a very complicated world uh, when you look at the different types of technology that we have in our stores, uh, things that we have in the forecourt, other things that we have going on. Um, and so that, to architect it, being deliberate about what cloud can do for you, where some of the breakpoints are, and, and building the appropriate structures around those. Um, I think is really important, uh, both from an industry standpoint and then as individual retailers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've just uh, started the process of evaluating and, and some small pilots as we look at 
um, virtualization capability at the store level and, and what that uh, what that's going to look like what that's going to mean in terms of uh, operationally what that looks like in terms of uh, applications what, what do we need to do to re-architect the application layer uh, to operate in that world so um, it, we've got a ways to go to fully understand that but certainly uh, are putting a lot of effort into moving forward down that path yeah I mean just just general integration challenges um, you know I mean I, I would just I would challenge everyone here I mean we, we've got a group here of retailers that are on this on this uh, on this board here but I mean everyone here is going to be walking the expo floor later today some of you are exhibiting uh, some of you have exhibits that you, that you have to show to retailers some of you are retailers that are going to be viewing the, the exhibits I mean I would just I would push to make sure that a solution that looks attractive that looks like something that would be beneficial for your company that you know you you ask those questions do you have this do you have this on your roadmap do you uh, are you already adhering to Conexus standards? Are you are you a member of Conexus? You know, are are you making that an, an important part of your your company's long term vision? Because if not, you know, you're going to eventually face with that solution that brick that I talked about earlier. You know, you're going to come across a roadblock where the integration is a huge challenge. So, so uh, integration is is. Uh, yeah, so to support all of them here, uh, technologies are there in the market already, but the problem is when you try to onboard them to your ecosystem is a big pain point. There's a lot of roadblocks, there's no seamless integration between those technologies. So we are, we are here to push that uh, API standard for through Connexus. I'm going to open it up to the audience. Does the audience have any questions for this panel? These guys are knee deep in, in migrating their enterprises. Anybody have any questions about their journey? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've developed our uh, APIs that we are you know, within our ecosystem that we're exposing to the outside world, being our customers, partners, sometimes our competitor. Cause it could be the, our customer. Um, how are you dealing with the risk mitigation of of them using your utilizing your data in not its intended way? So, like you know, if you're going to expose data, which could be very valuable data, and they can use it and monetize it or whatever. Um, like end user layer or end user agreements or what are you guys doing regarding that? That is a fantastic question. <laughs> um, we are not as far along as you are as far as exposing data um, outside of what would be the Sheets world. Um, but I think as part of your architecture and design, uh, those key questions you've got to account for and ask um, what, what could be the downside of exposing certain types of data and, uh, and allowing that outside your, your four walls. Um, but would be interested in hearing some of your successes and learnings as well. But it's, it's a great question. Yeah. yeah, I think the other element of that, going beyond the technology, it, it is for us, uh, we're having a lot more discussions about what those agreements look like when we engage with a partner um, in, in whatever context is, there's the commercial aspect of that and what uh, making sure at least you're clear on uh, where the boundaries are uh, in that context is a key part of that. Yeah, I know. I know with us. I mean, the 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 amount of uh, of efforts we would put towards APIs would be limited uh, compared to some. You know, we're a roughly 50 store chain, and um, we would just be looking at some of the core core areas to to deploy this at. But you know, like with anything with technology, it's a slippery slope if you get too aggressive, if you put too much of your your core information out there. So, um, I mean, it's a. I agree. I mean, it's a it's a good conversation to have, but I don't know that it would apply. For, for us too much. Yeah, it's a journey. Um, so you, in the journey, you'll find holes in the, in the roads, but you just need to re-engage and adapt to the systems. And then uh, initially you can sign up those NDAs, but you'll always find so, some holes in the, on the way. And then <coughs> you just need to re-engage your team down the path. Any other questions coming out of the audience? I have a question to the audience. <clears throat> the session that was here before was strategic partnerships between the CIO and the rest of the company. How many people feel that they have a strategic input in the strategic planning within their organizations as IT, that, that IT and, t and data technology is adequately represented in their strategic thought process? Show of hands. How many feel you could do it better? Good. <laughs> Because that's one of our objectives as well. Um, 
Great article from the Wall Street Journal two weeks ago talking about um, Gartner. Their number one recommendation is that there should be a non-executive board position for an IT professional in every company because technology is strategy. Got a question? Yeah, I just want to see if you guys can comment a little bit about choices of platforms, whether it's API uh, with Apigee or AWS Gateway or Mule. How do you all come to conclusions of, of which platforms you're using in those kind of choices? <coughs> I can tell you we haven't made that decision yet. That's, uh, we're, we're literally in, in the middle of that evaluation process. Um, and in fact, there's, uh, there's another alternative you didn't mention in that question uh, in the form of what do we build ourselves? And so we're trying to figure out what that buy versus build balance is uh, and then evaluate partners for, the, for that element uh, of the buy uh, uh, portion of that, who fits best in our world given uh, how we're going to approach that. We're in the same place, um, and you're going to need to commit to something. You're going to have to jump in. If you saw that really fun slide that, that Gray has that he'll talk about <coughs> tomorrow, um, you know, on IT transformation and the places that we have to be, uh, this is really uh, the, the infrastructure that allows that to happen. So I don't think there's a perfect solution out there, but there are enough solutions out there. Um, pick the right one for you. Uh, make it work. Uh, they will evolve over time, um, as your organizations will. Um, but we're we're in the same path of we're we're probably three to six months away from a decision on the on the one that we're going to go with. Yeah, we don't we don't have the the development uh, footprint that these these two gentlemen to my left have. So we're in the buy only mode. Uh, we're we're restricted to those options there. But uh, we're we're also we're still navigating the waters and trying to make the best decision on a you know solution by solution basis yeah i'm same pace with daniel <coughs> we are also on the buy on mode we don't uh, do a in-house development right now so we have a modest proposition along those lines um to that point um we'll talk about it a little bit later in this presentation at the close <coughs> but um Connexus is very much in a competition for those services and we see the opportunity for the industry is you can all go out and pay MuleSoft to pay bespoke APIs to deploy in your own enterprise. And if you have scale, that may make sense. Um, or we can develop a slate of APIs, 28 to 32, that are available to you to use as part of the membership. And you get through that. And then you can focus your API development on those things that are only important to you. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Jim likes to call it the race. We're the 11th vendor that he's considering. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted David to come on up. I want to do a quick close on this, get to one last question uh, to talk about APIs and API sourcing. So David, this may have packed up. Thank you guys. That was, that was really good. Uh, let's see. Okay, there we go. Way back. So I, I'm going to not read this slide. But Conexus is attempting to take our existing standards we've worked on for almost 20 years now. There is the core of those standards is a really great starting point, and it's a great starting point to have non-bespoke solutions and to have commonality um, across all these APIs. And it also gives a way where vendors can, you know, implement a couple of APIs on Connexus standards they already have, but put the API part in. It, it gives them an on-ramp. Uh, there are other things that we're doing. We're trying to provide guardrails, uh, which are essentially documents that state how you should write an API. Um, we are trying to make our guardrails compatible with any of the, the major vendors. Somebody mentioned, mentioned MuleSoft. Uh, there are also our open standards, uh, OAS 3.0, which is what we're uh, targeting. OAS 3.0 now runs on MuleSoft. Uh, you can go check that. Uh, so we are, we are trying to come up with things that we, we do not lock out any of these um, uh, solutions. Uh, we have a process for submitting APIs from the outside so that they can become standards really quickly. Uh, our whole purpose is to maximize the benefit to retailers and also minimize the technical debt caused by bespoke solutions. Because having common standards sta um, underpinning the APIs themselves uh, helps make the APIs uh, that much more broadly um, useful. 
So we are partnering, partnering with International Four Court Standards Forum. Uh, they've been around for 25 years in Europe, and they give us a global presence in how we're, uh, in how we're approaching this, uh, this problem. And a lot of people may wonder why they actually need a global presence. Well, the, the fact is uh, companies are starting to cross boundaries. Also, um, companies like Alibaba are coming here. Uh, they're starting to sell things. Uh, a global footprint is essential for not, not just technical standards, but for NACs in general. So, so this, this sort of uh, um, trans uh, global API system is going to be really helpful for everybody, I think. One really important part of this effort is the creation of a data dictionary that is specific for our industry. <coughs> that will mean that even vendors that you ask to write a specific API could use that data dictionary so that the fields that are common are still in common. That eases all of the other kinds of data cleansing that you might have to do if you were creating um, a, a system that feeds AI. You, you don't want that data to be in some totally different format. Uh, we actually have a domain. Uh, it's called openretail.org, and this is where all of our common work is being hosted. So we've approved these documents. There are four documents there. This is how we are telling people that they write APIs, and we actually have an example file, which is OAS 3.0. Uh, we also are creating uh, some educational materials. And really quickly, I want to tell you what Connexus is doing right now. We are taking our existing uh, APIs, or actually our existing standards, and wrapping them in APIs. So the first one is PS POS Act activity reporting, PARA, that's what I call it, uh, POS data configuration, uh, PDCA, that's what Daniel and some of the other panelists were talking about, uh, and also a, a cloud calculator. I'm not going to go into that one, but come by the Conexus booth and we can talk about it. This is just an example of what the PARA uh, APIs look like. It's about um, between PARA, PDCA, and uh, the, the cloud calculator, it comes to about 28 to 32 APIs, and that doesn't count the other APIs we need to write for all of the other uh, groups. For instance, fuel control. We want this to be, become API uh, wrapped. Also, digital offers have made uh, strides in this direction. And then finally, at the low end, uh, we say these are low, it's mainly that our groups haven't started working on them yet. Loyalty, mobile payments, and this very last one, front-end processor, uh, we're, we're attempting to pull that in for gift card processing. We've never had an API. We're gonna probably make that our first cloud API for doing, uh, doing any kind of payment. And it will connect to EPS or it will also have the ability to be used separately, which we actually think a lot of people will wanna do. So just a really quick blow through of this. This is where we are today. POS connects back office. We have a, a corporate system. This has worked well for 20 years, 25 years. What we're trying to do here is decouple those two systems. And I'll show you the advantages in a second. If you look at PARA, the uh, activity reporting, POS pushes data and the back office pulls data. This has a number of benefits and the uh, back office system has a smaller PCI footprint as a result. That's one advantage. But there are other advantages. For PDCA, it's turned around. The back office pushes and the POS pulls. And if this were all it did, this would kind of be a, a moot exercise. The real value comes because, as we said, there can be multiple vendors in the POS area in your store. You can have order ahead, you can have bring your own device, you can have uh, food service, you can have a mobile POS line buster. We may even add four quart uh, fuel dispensers to this list. It's an alternative form of API. All of the, our POS, all of those POSs are gonna be data hungry for exactly the same data. So they will now be able to both post their transactions and pull their data from the cloud system. This means that you can create this system in a very flexible way. A quick, quick one, and you come by the Connexus booth and I'll explain this one to you. It's probably a little too dense for here. But a lot of people ask, what if the cloud goes offline? Okay, what happens is you can have a small in-store uh, 
system that exposes the PARA interface so it can keep posting its transactions and when the cloud comes back online, it will sync back up with the main cloud. Uh, that what you have to keep in mind is Conexus is defining APIs. That means the content of the messages and the coordination of how those messages go back and forth. We are not building implementations of those APIs. That's what your vendors do. So what are the strategic advantages? Hopefully it unlocks your data resources multiple uses, multiple sources, and it makes it possible for you to use your data in new and inventive ways. Uh, ultimately, it will improve interoperability over what Connexus has done today. And, I mentioned this a while ago, it gives you the ability, if you can figure out the legal ease, to attract partners uh, and, and actually grow your business in new ways that you hadn't thought of. So, uh, what does it do for you? Speed to completion, agility, more relevance, and greater adoptability in our industry because we are all in competition with Alibaba and with Target and with Walmart. I think we've said this a hundred times. We are a little bit late to the game when it comes to APIs, but we are trying to make it possible for our merchants to compete in this kind of uh, global system. So join us. Uh, come to Connexus, help us move the ball. At least come by the booth and let me give you a more in-depth uh, talk. And the takeaways, just check these out. Uh, new uses of data, urgent challenges, I think we went through that, transformational technologies, why, are, why is bespoke bad, uh, and how, are, how do APIs help make all of the strategy work? And why is it not a problem that the cloud might go offline? So I wanted to talk about one last point <clears throat> um, to wrap it up with, from uh, this presentation and the discussions. Uh, we said, who are you going to use? MuleSoft, are you going to use uh, one of the vendors? Uh, you probably will. Um, what we have undertaken this year is, a, is really a, uh, the start of a $2 million investment on behalf of both the European and the US industries to move from an XML structure to an API structure. Um, what we're talking about is, uh, in the past, we gave you XML documents, implementation guides, and said, go to it. And what we ended up with, and when I talked to retailers, was we got partial implementations um, because vendors were hurried. Um, it, we really didn't fulfill our mission. And so what we really are now talking about is creating APIs, having vendors create and contribute APIs that substantially, in fact, entirely uh, adhere to the standards of quality and the standards of operation in the data dictionary created by the retail members of both of our organizations. And that Connexus and IFSF are going to stand as, as program managers and lifecycle managers of those APIs. Are we talking about really esoteric APIs? No, we're talking what I call table stakes APIs, architectural migration APIs uh, that everybody's gonna have to do. And in this case, um, everybody can go out and pay somebody to do, uh, and the industry will pay tens of millions of dollars, and it'll take us tons of years to get them all done. And at the end of the day, we won't have a standard data set on either side of those APIs. It'll be a bespoke application with all of the maintenance things that are in place. So in this graphic, it's a very simple exercise. If an API takes 100 days to do, take it through quality, through testing, and take it into deployment, it's gonna cost somebody $47,000. That's a bespoke API. Standard, two vendors working on the project. Five man days per vendor to do the integration. Um, if we have a standard and we have non-compliant vendors who are doing it, that cost drops down to about $14,000. But if we have a repository of APIs that a vendor can come in, and I want to tell you, we have 175 members, 122 of those are vendors, all right? 51 of those are retailers. So we've got pretty much everybody in the industry already engaged in this. If you, they can come in and pull a standard out of the repository and they've already pre-integrated it somewhere else, even one vendor and another vendor integrated it somewhere else over here, then you basically have an effective cost of zero to implement that standard. And that's an important thing to remember. So we think we can do this better, faster, and cheaper. And I wanted to find that as this. Better meaning you're going to end up with standards. Faster meaning that I think we can compress time to market over a wide deployment of the market by 90%. And I think cheaper, at least by 90%.
And then that leaves and frees up resources within your own organization to go and talk to MuleSoft about, okay, I really need this secret sauce thing in my organization and it's not covered by a Conexus standard. Let's go and invest in that because I've already got the POSBO stuff taken care of. I've already got the EPS stuff taken care of and the four court control stuff taken care of. So that is really our strategy going forward. We're gonna materially change Conexus to do that. And that's where I'm competing with these, these 10 other guys. We have to move very, very quickly. And uh, the other background story on these folks is every one of these guys has been involved for the last nine months in defining how we do this and how we can best help the industry. And I gotta also highlight the data dictionary is probably the most important work product of this effort. If we can define all the data elements that you need, 90% of them, in a common data dictionary, as David said, even if we don't have a standard and you bring some vendor who has been successfully implemented to another retailer in China, and you bring them over and you use that data dictionary, I guarantee you then when you get to doing machine learning and the other analytics down the road, you don't have to worry about cleansing your data. It's pre-cleansed, it's pre-structured, and it's in your common data repository. So. That's a big, tall item. Um, it's been the busiest year ever for Conexus in our 26-year history. And I just wanted to ask, what else can Conexus do for you guys? Is there something that we're forgetting about? Is there something that's burning issue on your plate that we should be looking at besides you know, the other stuff that we do in this? None? Okay. Um, we are at the end of our time. I'd like to thank our panelists um, for their thoughtfulness and, uh, and their ongoing contributions, uh, which is no small thing. And I would like to invite you to come down to the Conexus booth where we can help you deep dive into what we're doing and how you guys can participate and help drive what we're doing, okay? So thank you very much.